So we're rapidly closing down on 2023. 2024 will soon be here. And I pray that as we close out the year, you have a safe evening. Whatever you're doing tonight, I pray it is safe. But we're all asking the question, what's going to happen in 2024? Is it going to be a good year or is it going to be a bad year? What are some of the things on the horizon that we have to look out for? Well, for example, maybe there's another uh, virus coming in. I just heard that there's an RSV, a respiratory virus, that's over in China that's affecting little kids and uh, that it's started to come over to the United States. Is that something that we have to worry about? Now, the Chinese authority have said, nothing to see here, it's okay, don't worry about it, but I just wonder. Or maybe the economy will tank. There are some that have predicted that 2024 will have some sort of major collapse on the stock market either a correction or a recession or a depression. Uh, the polling firm Ipsos did a poll recently on December 18th, and it apparently about 50% of the United States, States thinks that the economy is going to even get stronger next year, and about 50% of the United States says it's all going to collapse next year. So I don't know who to believe. And how about the U.S. presidential election? That's going to happen next year, too. And if things shape up as if they are, it's going to prove to be a pretty exciting election for sure. And it'll be a one to watch for the, for the ages. Oh, and don't forget about some of the standard things that we have to worry about. For example, global warming. According to Earth.com, 2024 will be the first time in human history that we may surpass the critical 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit agreed upon at the Paris Climate Accord, whereby if we approach that threshold, it's irreversible harm to our climate. Let me think, what else am I missing? Uh, oh yeah, war, that's right, we've got war in Ukraine, we've got war in Israel, everywhere is war. Will there be more wars next year or next wars or fewer wars next year? Several important leading figures are predicting that 2024 may be the year for maybe a global World War III. Now, if you look at all of this together, there is a great reason to fear. Surely one of these things will happen and cause havoc and disrupt our lives. However, except for a few stock market corrections, none of these things really will impact the average person on the street, will they? In other words, for most of us, life will go on no matter what happens in these things. Probably most of us won't even know if these things happen. I remember years ago, we purchased our home in 2007, and it was at the top of the market. And then the global financial crisis hit. All the property values plummeted substantially, and a lot of people were afraid, but eh, if you hold on to your house long enough, eventually it will come back. It's all on paper anyway. The only important values you really have to worry about are when you buy the house and when you sell the house, right? Maybe that will be something for my kids to deal with. Maybe they'll have to sell my house. Who knows? There's always the standard food shortage or water shortage or energy shortage or petroleum shortage, all these shortages and all these projections of doom and gloom, they come around all the time, but they've always been around since the beginning of time. There have many, been many, many researchers that have tried to figure out, is there a cycle to this? Is there a pattern to this? To try to wrap their arms around it. And several different researchers have come up with all sorts of different theories. For example, the Turchin Hackett Fisher theory, which is that basically societies will experience a collapse every 250 years or so. And when are they predicting the next collapse? Oh, the 2020s. Or the Amari Fabry Spengler theory, which says that civilizations go through life cycles that last several thousand years. And to people who ascribe to this theory, they say that the United States looks a lot like Rome did right before the Civil War in 40 BC. Or you could look at the economist Wilhelm Pareto, who said that it's not really a cycle, except that what happens is that 
you end up with more and more wealth inequality in any nation until the point where the wealth inequality becomes so great that the people without wealth will form a revolution and then it all, all starts over again. They don't give a projection about where we are in this, but when you look at the income distribution in the United States today, you can see that it certainly is something that we should be concerned about and it could be leading towards some sort of havoc. I'm not an expert in global warming. I'm not an expert on the economy. I'm not an expert on diseases or war or politics. But one thing that I have studied quite a bit is the human condition. And the truth is, is that the human condition is broken. And no amount of planning or preparation or theories can stop mankind from messing it up from once every once in a while or from time to time. So who knows if 2024 will be one of those years where it all falls apart. We just don't know. But I do know that there will one, be one thing that will be in short supply. And that will be critical to our world to navigate the crises as they come. And that will be strong Christian leadership. Strong. Because when things start to get tough, we need Christian leaders to step up and take leadership roles, not only in themselves, but in the organizations or the families that they're a part of. And good, because the people that may step up may not be good, but we know that God is good, and we know that he's called his church to love the world around us. Today we're finishing 2024, and we spent all year looking at leadership, both in the church and outside the church and in our own lives. And today, as we close out this series, I would like to just put a capstone thought in your head about what leadership is going to mean in the future. And to do that, I'd like to look at the words of Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is talking on the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll begin reading in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Can any of us, by worrying, add a single hour to our life? You know, at the time of Jesus, there were certainly a lot of things to worry about. As we just said, they experienced the Roman Civil War and they had just lived through that not too recently and people were still not trusting institutions and trusting each other. It was a very difficult time. There was a lot of poverty. There certainly was a lot less food than we have today. The food that they had was simple, basic food just to stay alive. In that time, there was incredible stress and turmoil and lack of food Everything was difficult at that time. And that's where Jesus came from. And Jesus said, don't worry. We've got it under control. Don't worry. Jesus says, don't worry about what you eat or drink or your body. God loves you and he cares about you and he's got it under control. Jesus said the same thing in the Lord's Prayer. In one of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. That's about all we can pray for, right? Lord, solve the problem for me today, and I'll let tomorrow worry about itself. Stress and worry are part of the human condition. And stress and worry, when not checked, can cause all sorts of physical damage in your life. So what does Jesus say? He says, Put God first. Have a God-based perspective on your life. All of the things that you worry about, you worry about because you ha don't have this God perspective in your life. And all of these people that tell you that there's doom and gloom in the future, they do this because they want power or they want the things of the earth to take over the things of God. But you see, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, put God first and everything else will be falling into place. I, um, 
I listened every once in a while to different podcasts. I was listening to an interview of a guy who's a, a geo scientist. He looks at the earth and the history of the earth and those sort of things. And uh, he teaches classes or used to teach classes at one of the major universities. And he said, the last years that I, were teach that I was teaching, one of the things that was just so difficult and challenging for me is that when these new students came into my class, they were all so worried about the future. They had been taught from an early on that everything's going to fall apart and that because humans have caused so much damage to the world, it's, it's only a matter of time before it all falls apart. And he said, one of the things I did then was I went and actually got the latest reports of all the different scientists that are coming up with all these predictions. And we would go through these reports line by line. And we would show that they're just predictions. They're not guarantees. And after we would go through this exercise, the students were so grateful because they had hope for tomorrow. His question is, why were incoming students believing these things, that threat was imminent? And he said, it's because the media just loves to highlight all the negative things because it sells. But there's as many good things about the future as there are negative. You just don't hear about them. And so when they look at these models, they take the worst case situation of each model. Now, I have no problem with models. I love models of the future. As a matter of fact, I think that a model is a great way to predict what may happen in the future for different things. Um, the problem is we don't always get the models right. Then the models are just that. They're models. They're not exact science. I mean, just take a look at hurricane models. Have you ever seen hurricane models? There are so many different schools across the world that when a hurricane is beginning to form, what they'll do is they'll plug all the data into a model and they'll have different projections about the path of the hurricane. And if you put them all on top of each other, you'll see that most of the models kind of follow one path, but you'll have a stray model going off in a different direction. And they look at all of them because nobody can predict the future. I mean, they're just models. The best way to predict the future for a hurricane is just to be prepared for a hurricane. And then if you get a hurricane in your community, then you know that you are prepared for a hurricane. The problem is we don't like to prepare, do we? And we don't know which model is right. What does that mean for the Christian leader? The stock market, the housing market, the economies of the world, all these things, they go up and down. It's a natural condition of the human race. Today, we have more technological ways to deal with the future, but we have less trust in each other to deal with the future. So we need good Christian leaders to have the right perspective in life. The things in this world aren't the main thing. Jesus is the main thing. The things of this world will rise and fall, but Jesus remains constant. And you can spend your whole life worrying about these things so much that you forget the important things in life. Don't worry about the little things. Observe them. Be present in them. See God's hand in them. Try to make a better outcome if you have the ability to do that. But worrying about it? That is a wrong perspective for any Christian leader. On your deathbed, the things that will be important are the things that you should worry about. Who you are and whose you are. You know, I've been so blessed in my life with family members that have shared with me the love of Jesus and told me the important things of life are Jesus. And I've been grateful for that. There was a a group of men that lived out in the desert in Egypt right after Jesus. They were called the Desert Fathers. And they weren't monks, but they're what happened before monks. There was this period of time uh, when they would go out into the desert and they would spend all time in quiet solitude um, communing with God. And the thing is, people would come to them constantly asking them questions because they were so connected with God, they had great counsel and so people would seek them out because the world is a dangerous and a stressful place and you want to have people who are so connected with God that you know that you're going to get an answer or have a discussion with them that's a God-based answer 
And as I look into the future, we need a lot more people than that, than just the Desert Fathers. As a matter of fact, the Desert Fathers turned into monks. And one of the problems that the monks had is that they lived in their own isolated communities and they never interacted with the world. What we need, what God calls, is strong Christian leaders who are there. They're like a tree planted by streams of living water so that when the stress happens in the world, these are the people that people come to and say, is it okay? And the strong Christian leader says, I don't know about the future, but I know who holds the future. And yes, the future is in good shape. Life is tough. One of the things of any gathering of Christians is to help people be so grounded in their faith that as they leave this place, they share that grounded faith with a world that so desperately needs it. If you have children, if you have a family, if you have a workplace, if there's anybody in your life that you can help along the journey, help them embrace a God-based perspective. But we continue on. Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? The other thing that is needed to navigate a challenging future is just to build your faith. Continue to build your faith no matter what happens. Everything that we have in this life is an opportunity to build our faith. Faith is what separates the followers of Jesus from the non-followers of Jesus. Faith that Jesus has it under control. And for people who have lost their faith, I, I just, I honestly, I feel sorry for them. I mean, how did they have hope about the future? When bad things happen, who do they turn to? And yet we know that in all things we can turn to Jesus and in everything build our faith. I've said this before, but faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it grows. And so use your faith. Have big faith. Wherever God has placed you, grow your faith. It doesn't matter if it's a difficult situation or if it's an easy situation. We can grow our faith in all things. I don't know if you've ever heard or talked to anybody that's a day trader on the stock market. Now, I am not a day trader on the stock market. I don't understand it. And I certainly think it takes a lot of time to follow those types of things. And I don't have time to do that sort of thing. But the people who do, who get into the stock market either for a portion of a day or for a few days, are those people that say, listen, I can make money in the stock market if it goes up or down. All I have to do is predict which way it's going to go. And then I can make money because I've predicted the way it's going to go. And it doesn't matter if the stock market goes up or if the stock market goes down. They can make money. Well, the same thing is true with your faith. It doesn't matter if you have a good day or a bad day, if there's a lot of stress in your life or not a lot of stress in your life. Recognizing God in your life, in the good times and the bad times, builds your faith. It strengthens your faith. It doesn't matter if it goes up or down because Jesus is in charge. All it takes is an understanding that all things work for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You can build your faith at any time. And so what Jesus says is build your faith. We need people of strong faith as the world starts falling apart. People of strong faith are going to help keep the world from falling apart. So yes, put God in the center and build your faith. But Jesus goes on in verse 31. So do not worry saying about what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, listen, you can worry about the future if you want to, but you can't change it. And by worrying about it, you can't change it. And the people who worry about the future are either people that are pagans that run after it because they're so worried about the future or people who can get 
rich or have power because of what the future may hold. And so they want to create a future for them. There's nothing wrong with planning for the future, but Jesus says the future, I've got the future under, under control. Don't worry about it. What, what you need to do as a follower of me is to be present in the moment now, to know that I'm in charge. All the people projecting doom and, doom and gloom, they do this because they want to control the future. But they can't control the future. The only person that can control the future is Jesus. He has the future in his arms. But what he wants you to do is to be present in the present. There are a lot of people that think that some new technology is going to save us in the future. And maybe there will be a technology that's going to save us in the future. But what saves us in the present is Jesus. And being present in the present saves us. This whole thing that happened with COVID and so many people worrying about what the future would hold and and who was going to die and who was at risk and all of these things. And the one thing that I learned through all of that was that no matter how smart and intelligent, how many things that we put on the market to try to fix the future, we can't fix the future. There are just some things that are too big to fix. So I agree that we should plan for the future, do what we can to reduce the impact of the future if it's going to be a negative impact. But don't worry about it. Jesus has got it. He's got it under control. You know, the church today is struggling. There are a lot of people that don't trust the church today. And so you worry, like I worry, about what the church of tomorrow is going to look like. How can we help people see Jesus in a way that connects with them? In such a way that they can't live without Jesus and his grace and his love and mercy. And sometimes I look at it and say, I don't know. But Jesus knows. Worry is fear-based and it is against God because God says not to worry because I've got it under control. I have bought and purchased you. You are mine. And I'm never letting go of you. You are my precious child. And a lot of people that do research about what the future will look like. We talked about different models. The one that I've just really had a fascination with over the last six months uh, is called the fourth turning. I don't know if you heard about it, but it's by uh, Strauss and Howe. And uh, they started looking into generational theory. And what generational theory is, is long periods of time are there cycles that you can identify. And they've identified a future that consists of four cycles or a, a time frame that consists of four cycles. And they, they liken these cycles to um, the seasons. Like first there's a season of joy and happiness where everybody is free and everybody trusts everybody and we're all so happy with each other. And then it goes from spring into summer where some of the doubts start to pop up. And then from summer it goes to autumn where we really, really aren't trusting of each other. And then from autumn it goes into winter. And winter is what they call the fourth turning. And the fourth turning is a time when people don't trust each other. They don't trust institutions. They don't trust anything. It's a time of turmoil. It's often accompanied by war. It's often accompanied by horrible things in the stock market and diseases and all of these things. And they've gone back throughout all of the United States history and they can clearly identify these turnings. There are each about four generations and each generation is about 20 to 20, 20, 20, 22 years. Now, the interesting thing is this book was written back in 1997 and they said in early 2000, we're going to experience what they call the fourth turning. They said in the 2000s, the 2010s and the 2020s is going to be a period of time that we haven't seen in the United States for four generations. It's going to be people not trusting each other. It's going to be probably people on edge. It might be accompanied by war. It might be accompanied by famine. But these are dark, dark times. And the interesting thing is, is you look at this book and you say, I can see how this might be true, that maybe we are in the fourth turning. Now, the good news is that they say by 2020, 28, 2020, 2030, we should be out of the fourth turning and then we'll back to the spring of joy and people trusting each other and things just happy again. And I hope that that happens. And I look at that and I, I'm kind of sad because my whole entire 
pastoral career happened in the fourth turning. So I never got to experience yet what it would be like to be a pastor when everybody trusts each other and everybody loves each other. So I would be looking forward to that. But whether or not there's a fourth turning, whether or not this philosophy holds true, it doesn't really matter for us. What matters to us is that God continues to create strong leadership in his church. Because no matter what happens in the world, it's the church that God has called together to be strong, good leaders in the world around us. We may be in the fourth turning or the first turning. We may be having lots of stress in the world or it may be peace in the world. But the one thing that we know for sure is that Jesus is in charge of the world, no matter what. And because you're his precious child, your future is secure. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God in all things, help us to seek you, to find you, and to know that you exist and love us every minute of our life. Help us in the future, no matter what. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. All right.